Oh dear, right. So um, as uh, Paul sort of intimated, um, this is not of interest. So this is not a poll poll. It's not going to be a Zoom poll, but for, think fingers up or thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, does that, how many people of you know, um, obviously I've got some new screens are off, but thumbs up or thumbs down if you know what my day job was while I was playing rugby? I do now. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's about half and half. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, I joined the Royal Air Force in 1983 after I left school. Uh, my dream was to be a pilot and uh, didn't have enough um, qualifications to go and do the, um, the long course to do, become a commercial pilot and join BA. So I decided I'd go and uh, join the Royal Air Force. I think one of the um, uh, RAF sort of recruitment uh, videos, I'll always remember, uh, one of us watching this um, Jaguar pilots going through training and flying through the valleys in Scotland. And the abiding memory I've got of that and what really got me to think, you know, I want to join the Air Force was um, one of them saying, well, you can't do a loop the loop in a jumbo jet. So I figured, yeah, that, that's that's for me. Um, quite happy with that. And so, uh, as I said, I joined the Royal Air Force in uh, 1983 at the age of well, 19. I commissioned on June the 15th, uh, 1983, four days before my 20th birthday. So, um uh, joined the Air Force, and I'd played rugby by that stage for um, Durham. I'd got a uh, England uh, B, in those days it was a B, England B, uh, as opposed to England A nowadays, and uh, played for Durham County as well as Yorkshire. Uh, so I'd, I'd been on the radar um, in the sort of um, the rugby scene, but not so much uh, from uh, the Air Force's idea. I knew something was going to be up when uh, I tried to get in the Air Force um, straight after school, and they said to come back here later, mature a bit. So I did. I applied, got in, and uh, so I was uh, waiting to hear back from the Air Force. And I played a few more games for various representative teams. I suddenly got this phone call back at home at Mum's place. I live up in Barnard Castle at the time uh, with my mum, and um, this guy said, "Hi, it's Squanny de So and so, I can't remember his name." And he said, uh, "Just like to let tell you, you've been successfully." Um, accepted to come and join the Royal Air Force and go through uh, initial officer training, which is fantastic news. And he said, um, when would you like to start? We've got these courses on. When does your rugby fit into it? So I knew that something was going to go on with regards to how the Air Force was going to um, look after me during that time. So I joined the Royal Air Force on the 13th, uh, on the Sunday, the 13th of February. I know that day because the day before Valentine's Day. And... Um, I suppose I should have realised the way that the Air Force was going to go when on Monday afternoon I was dragged into the um, the wing commander's office and told tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock you're to be uh, outside your billet with your kit ready for being away for two days um, to go and play for the Royal Air Force. And so literally on my second day, I had to be at the billet at four o'clock, got picked up by somebody, taken to stay with somebody in Grantham. I jumped on the train at six o'clock in the morning from Nottingham. I got a train down to Plymouth. I played uh, for the Royal Air Force against Plymouth Albion um, on uh, the Wednesday night. Stayed overnight there, jumped on the train on Thursday, got a train back to Grantham, then got dropped off uh, at RF Cranwell um, at about four o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Uh, and my first week in the Royal Air Force at IOT, initial officer training, uh, I spent two days of it traveling to and from Plymouth Albion, having played for the Royal Air Force. So I pretty much knew the way things were going to go. So I graduated as a... Um, uh, 20th of no, the 15th of June 1983 and went to do basic flying training and uh, I went through the flying training system and uh, eventually I ended up uh, flying the Canberra at um, uh, RAF uh, Witten but I remember one of my early days um, of uh, 1985 uh, here I got um, my second year of playing for England I got my first uh, cap in 1984 uh, when I was going through flying training so basic flying training well, no, I'll tell you that story as well, because I remember the day I found out, that's right, yeah, I um, I got a phone call um, from um, Derek Morgan on a Sunday night telling me I'd been selected to play for England, and he said that I wasn't allowed to tell anybody about it until the next day when they were going to announce the, it to the press. And so when it when it got announced the next day, it was all massive, and uh, the Air Force obviously wanted to take the most out of the, um, the prestige of having a, an RAF you know, training pilot to become um, going to be playing for England, and um, they wanted you know, the press descended on. So I was at a small RF base called Swinderby, which is a small base just south of Lincoln, just off the A46 on the Fossway, and um, sorry on Ermine Street. 
and um, uh, the press descended. And you can imagine, I'm a winger. My name's Rory, and I've been playing for England. So the, the puns were going out left, right, and centre. The unfortunate thing was that I just happened to be holding at that place at the time, and the only aircraft they had there uh, was a chipmunk. Anybody knows a chipmunk? A chipmunk is a single propeller um, monoplane, which is uh, basically a trainer. And all the jets at uh, Cranwell, that was flying the jet provost, couldn't get there. So that had to make do. And I can remember that I had to stand on this wing on this chipmunk and I was carrying a, a, a helmet under one arm and a ball under the arm on the, on the wing doing all the typical pictures you had to do. And um, the, the papers on the Tuesday morning, they had all this jet ace roar into it, wing commander. You can all imagine all the puns coming out and there's me looking very steely-eyed and jockey-like with the, a ball under arm, uh, you know, and a helmet and I'm still on a, on a flipping um, propeller aircraft. So that was the start of me getting to know about the press and playing for England. But one of the other stories I want to tell you was about when I was in 85 and I got my first cap to go and play against Ireland over there. So I've been picked on the Sunday again, because we know about a week beforehand, you get, you get announced and the, the team gets picked. In those days, it was pretty much, you found out on, on CFAX or Teletext, that's how you used to find out whether you're in the team or not. And I'm sure, uh, there's a few of you who'd be too young to know what CFAX and Teletext is, but uh, the majority of the pictures I can see will know what I'm talking about. Oh, I can hear some people laughing as well. So there you go. Yeah. So um, uh, it was fine. So I, I, you know, normally in those days, it was um, uh, Thursday, Friday were the days off. And uh, I got this phone call about Monday or Tuesday. Monday, I think it was. I got this phone call uh, in the squadron and um, it's... It's Corporal Wilson here, sir. Oh, hi, Corporal. What's, what's the problem? Uh, I, I understand you've been selected to play for England uh, on the weekend. I said, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. He said, um, have you have you um, have you applied for permission to go to um, to Dublin? Uh, no. Why? And obviously, being a member of Her Majesty's forces, going to Dublin, we had to get uh, permission. And he said. Um, said, well, you're going to Dublin, you need to get permission from the embassy over there to go there as a member of Her Majesty's uh, forces. Oh, uh, right, okay, um, fine. Well, um, what do I need to do? Just tell me where to sign and I'll put it in. He said, ah, well, normally, sir, we need to give three weeks notice uh, before we can uh, get permission for you to go to Dublin. Oh, uh, that's a bit of a problem. Obviously, we've got four days. He said, yeah, I know. Uh, just leave it with me, I'll see what I can do. I'll have a chat with the station commander. So anyway, he goes off, gives me a call back. Says, "Right, I think we sorted it out. Obviously, the powers of B recognise that you can't not go to play for uh, for England, so we've got it sorted out. But there's a few things you need to do." I said, "Okay, fine." He said, "You need to go to uh, uh, the police HQ on the camp and go and get a security briefing. Go and get a security briefing because you're going to go to uh, uh, to Dublin. So uh, obviously, with all the troubles and all the sort of situations mid mid, mid 80s, uh, you need to get a briefing." I said, Okay, fine. Right, I'll do that. So four o'clock, I went across the police flight, walked in, off the door. Ah, oh, sir, yes, welcome in. Sit down there, watch this video about going to travel to Ireland. So click. And I sat there and was briefed for half an hour. It's never half an hour I'm going to get back in my life. So I was briefed. Right, uh, don't take any form of military clothing with you. So okay, fine, yeah. Don't take your 1250, which is our ID card, you know, showing that you're a member of forces. Okay, fine. Don't frequent Republican bars. And it went on like this. So you can imagine, you know, as you expect, don't go and do stuff that makes you stand out as a member of Her, um, Her Majesty's forces and don't go and uh, go and, you know, wander into Republican bars and, and show off. So I said, fine, okay, did that. And they said, keep yourself low key. I said, fine, I, I understand that, don't worry. So on the Thursday uh, afternoon after training, we flew across to uh, Dublin, landed, Got, picked my bags up from the carousel, walked to the door, and as soon as the doors opened out of the um, baggage uh, reclaim area, I walked out. This flipping huge giant of a six foot eight guard of policeman welcomed me and said, I'm your security officer, sir. All oh, right, okay, fine, cracky, you know. It's 2022 20, and I get my own security guard. That's really interesting. Jumped onto the coach, and we, in those days, we, we literally had um, guard of police outriders. And we literally didn't go anywhere less than 60 miles an hour uh, around Dublin. So we were shot to the hotel and we cars were stopped, lights straight through all the way to the hotel. And then we went to the hotel, spent the night and there was guard patrolling around the outside. 
And at night, there'd always be another guard officer stuck at the end of the corridor. It seems like strange nowadays, but that's the way it was in, in that time. <laughs> Train on Friday, no problem. Had the you know, police escort thing came back. Saturday, match. It's the usual stuff, preparation, got ready to go to the game. So we got the bus all the way to um, uh, Lansdowne Road. As I normally did, walked into the changing room, uh, took my bag in, put my bag down, picked up a programme off the, um, uh, the bench, walked out onto the pitch as we normally did, say with atmosphere, which way is the wind blowing, as the sun's out, do I need my studs, do I need moldies, lots of stuff, savouring it around. And uh, as you do, I don't know why, I looked into the programme to see what the team, you look at the team list and various things, what's in the programme. And I looked to see, okay, who's, who's, who am I playing against, which is my opposite wing, was it, I was going to be um, Trevor Ringland, uh, Ulster guy I played many times against. I looked down, had to notice, and I looked down and looked at the England team sheet and I saw, you know, who was it? And it was Chris Martin, Bath, um, 95, so it was, uh, was it John Carlton or Mike Harris? I can't remember now. I looked down, looked at my name and it said, Rory Underwood, brackets, Leicester Tigers and REF. So there you go. I went for a security briefing and I ended up with a flipping sniper's mark on my head with saying, oh, I'm in the Royal Air Force in the programme after I had a little brief. So that's made me laugh about that. And, um, you know, I've I had, a, had a great time. Just to give you some interest, if anybody's Stato type people are interested. So I went through the flying training system. I flew the uh, Jet Provost Mark V at Cranwell. I went to Valley uh, and flew the, uh, the Hawk um, trainer over at Valley. Got my wings there. Ended up going down to uh, RAF uh, Chivna at Barnstable did the attack weapons place there. So that's where they, so the first one is teaching how to fly. Second one is teaching how to fly uh, advanced flying. And the third one was teaching how to fight. So we did air combat, we did uh, gunnery, dropping bombs, that sort of stuff, and learning how to fly tactically at low level. Uh, and from there, I was posted onto the tornado. So I, I went to uh, Cottesmore, the tornado, the Tri National Tornado Training Establishment, Triple TE, at RF Cottesmore. Um, and uh, Managed about 14 hours and failed the course. We call it chopped. Uh, so there's a colloquial term we called it in the Air Force. So I, I failed the course and got chopped off the course. And it being posted to the, um, the Canberra, which is an old aircraft. Um, it, it was so old that one of the aircraft on there, Echo Mike, I'll never forget it. Echo Mike was actually laid down. It was first put down in 1948. This is the mainstay of uh, the British Air Force um, um, nuclear force back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and uh, it was first laid down in 1948. And I always find it strange. 48, you know, we were making a jet intermediate medium level bomber. This is three years after the end of the Second World War. It's quite amazing, actually, because uh, the jet fighter did start flying at the end of, this, um, of the Second World War, as most people know, Frank Whittle's uh, good old jet engine invention. Um, so I flew the Canberra for six and a half years out of um, uh, Witten near Huntingdon. And then I converted onto the Hawk again and flew with 100 Squadron for four and a half years. And that was a dream job. It's a fantastic job flying for 100 Squadron, spending most of my time uh, 100 Squadron flying at low level. I'll just give you some sort of idea. It's very difficult here. I'm, I'm on the fifth floor here, so it's not very high. But um, in, in a Hawk, when we're flying at low level, just to give you some idea, low level flying for us in the Royal Air Force is technically anything low level is anything below 2,000 feet, especially when you're not taking off and landing. So when you're out flying in the countryside, uh, low level. Um, is normally at 250 feet in peacetime. So we fly at 250 feet uh, for the youngsters amongst you. Uh, that's 80 meters. Uh, if you can't work that one out, if you take a, um, a rugby pitch or a hockey, field hockey pitch or, or a football pitch and you turn it on end, I would, I would fly underneath the top posts. That's how low you are when you're doing um, low level. So we're flying around 250 feet and uh, we're flying around 420 knots, which is give or take 450 miles an hour. But in knots, in, in nautical miles uh, an hour, we're doing seven miles a minute. Give you some sort of idea. Um, so it's it's quick and it's low. Uh, in wartime, there's no limit. So the guys, my colleagues, I never went out to and see saw active service, but the, the people of my generation went out and did the first Gulf War in 91. Uh, and uh, those that went out there, when you go to war, there's no limit. The limit's off. Obviously, for here, it's to do with peacetime, and it's obviously uh, trying to avoid annoying people when flying at low level. Um, but basically the only limit was what we call the sphincter factor. So you basically went as low as you dared before obviously uh, your bottom let you stop. So that's as simple as that. You went as low as you dared. And some of the videos that were coming back with the boys taking videos and stuff was incredible what they're doing. There were, some of them were flying across the desert uh, in the tornado and you could see the rooster tail coming out from the sand. 
uh, they were so low, as opposed to what you see the rooster tail coming out of uh, jet boats, etc. Um, I did four and a half years there. Got to, that was uh, 1996. Ended up going flying a desk. At some point, you'll always go and fly a desk. That's how I cloaked the term of an office job. Uh, did three years. And uh, then I finished off flying the Domini uh, at Irish Cromwell, which is like an executive jet, but we used for training our navigators and rear crew um, with the idea that I was going to go and uh, you know, leave the Air Force. So that was my 38 points. I did 18 years. I was going to leave at 2001. And I was probably going to go and fly uh, a jumbo jet and, and uh, take passengers. Uh, off on on the holidays. Didn't quite happen that way. I left the, the military in 2001 and ended up going and uh, you know, setting up a consultancy business and that's what I've been doing ever since. But at the same time, as I said, I, my first cap was playing for England in 1984 and uh, I was doing advanced, uh, sorry, basic flying training. And uh, the Air Force were outstanding. I've got a lot of time for what the Air Force uh, did for me. They, they really paved the way uh, for making sure I could go and do what I needed to do. And it's interesting how some people always thought that were in the Air Force that I actually took um, three months off, January, February, March, because they would see me playing in the Five Nations, as was in those days, and they see me on sort of uh, alternate weekends. And they pretty much thought that I was a professional rugby player. But in those days, I literally, in the early days, I was uh, had to be at, uh, at the Richmond, at the Petersham Hotel in Richmond um, by half past 12 on a Thursday. Uh, to be in time to have a bit of lunch and we went and trained on the Thursday afternoon we trained Friday morning captain's run and then we play on Saturday big dinner on the Saturday night and then we drive home on the Sunday and I was back to work um, eight o'clock met brief on uh, on a Monday morning and that was my cycle the whole of my international career uh, we used to get together towards the end when Jeff Cook took over and we became a little bit more I wouldn't say professional but a lot more professional than we were when we started we used to meet up on a Wednesday night and train on a Wednesday uh, and to give some sort of idea, I, I sort of describe it because people think the game's professional now, so that I was a professional rugby player, and I wasn't. I got I got paid nothing for playing until the last couple of years. The game went professional in 1995, and I literally got paid about one or two years with in the last end of my career, playing for club rugby. Um, in the whole time I played for England, I never got paid a penny for actually playing. Um, I had the uh, the pleasure and the privilege of being paid uh, 12p a mile mileage allowance. That's what I was allowed to get. Um, and so that was it. That was the time it was. And so the way I describe to people to give an idea is that my job was, was flying jets in the Royal Air Force. That's my day job. And uh, my hobby was playing rugby, albeit playing for England um, in front of 65,000 people on a Saturday. But that's, that's the way it was in those days. Um, as Paul said, I played for Leicester Tigers. Obviously, I joined uh, the Royal Air Force. And so very quickly, they picked me up uh, when I was uh, doing basic flying training. And so I, uh, I started playing for Leicester Tigers. I mean, I joined in 1983 when I joined Leicester Tigers. I joined the back line. So they had uh, Nick Youngs, Les Cusworth, myself, uh, Paul Dodge, Clive Woodward, uh, Barry Evans, and Dusty Hare. Those who know those names will know that's one hell of a flipping back line. That's a, that's a really good back line. And myself and Barry Evans were a similar age. We're both young 19, 20 year olds, really quick wingers and had all these guys in front of us. We had a fantastic time. It was an absolutely uh, wonderful time in that, in that early 80s when I first joined the club. Uh, and I stayed with them for 14 years. And wherever I went in the Air Force, I used to travel back and go and play for Tigers. Um, on, all the games were on a Saturday in those days. They didn't have Friday nights and Sunday type matches. Um, my first tour for England was 1987. Uh, we went... The World Cup started, that's when the World Cup started. And one would argue that that was probably the, um, the death knell of amateur rugby. It was just, there's the beginning of the end uh, when that started. Um, they relinquished the RFU, they, they eventually said, because they weren't going to go and take part in it, but they realised that they better take part rather than not. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, the Southern Hemisphere are going to go off on their own and then create a professional game. But it was going to happen at some point. So I toured, well, I say toured. The World Cup was in Australia in 1987. So that's where we went and had the World Cup. We didn't do very well. We got the quarterfinals and lost to Wales. Um, 88, I then toured Australia and Fiji. I know life's a bitch, I know. Um, had to go and tour Australia for four, four and a half weeks and we spent a week in Fiji. Uh, 1989 was my first Lions tour where we went to Australia. And that was a long tour in modern terms. I mean, that was, uh, it was about nine and a half weeks, 10 weeks uh, away, 1989, touring uh, Australia. And... Uh, that was my first line toss and we won that one. We won that 2-1. Uh, it was a decider. We won the third test to win the game. So it was uh, that series. 
Um, 89, 90, I actually had a year off. 91, England toured Australia again and Fiji. So we went back there again. Just, just want to check if it's still a nice place to go to. Uh, 92, I had a year off uh, at the stage because my uh, kids, my first child uh, arrived in 1990 and my second arrived in 91. So uh, I didn't think I'd be um, um, find a home to go back to if I took another year off uh, on tour when I had two young kids under the age of two. Um, 1983 was a Lions tour. So I went away uh, again. We had eight, nine weeks in New Zealand uh, in 1983. 1984 was a tour to South Africa, and that was a fascinating trip. We literally landed something like um, four or five to six a week or something like that after um, Nelson Mandela was uh, inaugurated as uh, as president. So we were the first outside sort of sporting team that arrived in South Africa uh, just after he was made president. Uh, and if you ever watched the Invictus film, you see that England were playing South Africa at that particular time. And we won the first game, the second game, and the whole... Uh, sort of friendship between Mandela and um, Francois Pina started during that particular time. And uh, then in 95, there was the World Cup uh, the following year where we played in South Africa. Uh, and everyone remembers, obviously, Francois Pina and Nelson Mandela uh, sharing the delights of uh, South Africa winning the World Cup in 95. My last game for England was 96. Uh, so I played for England for, for uh, 12 years, uh, hung my international boots up in 96. Uh, at the age of 33, and then I uh, retired from playing rugby in 1999 at the age of 36. So I'd spent my 14 years at um, uh, Leicester Tigers, and I finished two years at, uh, at Bedford before I eventually hung my boots up uh, at, the, um, at the age of 36. Um, so it's, it's, again, I sometimes get asked the question, people say to me, oh, so you did rugby and you did flying, so which did you do first? Did you do the flying first or the rugby first? At one point, how old do you think I am trying to do 12 and, and 14 years back to back? Um, and that's why I have to sell people, you know, the whole context. I did the two um, in parallel uh, at the time. And so I'm very conscious of my time here. So I've got to try and tell this story very quickly. So that's that's the, the sort of interesting sort of um, life that I led for 14, 15 years. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot, and, bit, and again, thumbs up, thumbs down. Does everybody know what the hacker is? A lot of thumbs up. Okay. So now, uh, again, thumbs up or thumbs down. So who, who thinks that it's um, fair enough, good, great, uh, that they're allowed to do the hacker, the New Zealanders, before they play a match? Who likes the idea? Oh, Colin's got his thumbs down. Oh, Charlotte. Well, that's not Charlotte, that's Robert, isn't it? Okay, we've got a bit of a mix. Okay. Uh, oh, you're a bit of, uh, Rosie, you're a bit of both ways. That's fine. So, okay, well, thumbs down, thumbs up. Okay, and basically the rest of you didn't vote it. Don't really give a shit, basically. Yeah, okay, fine. So it's one of the interesting things about the whole context about the um, the game. It's a wonderful part of uh, of the game. And, you know, it's in some ways it polarizes the viewers to whether they're allowed to do it. And I, I take it back to the story back in 1991 when uh, we had the World Cup in, in England. And uh, our first game in the World Cup was the host versus New Zealand as the uh, reigning champion. So we were playing first up was New Zealand. England had not played New Zealand at Twickenham uh, since 83. And we toured them in 1985 and I couldn't go because um, I was going through my flying training. So they, they stopped me going on the tours, but I was playing the, the Five Nations. So 83 and 85, and then the next game that England, New Zealand play was 91. So in our squad of, of uh, 26 players in the World Cup in 91, only one player had actually played against the All Blacks, and that was Peter Winterbottom. So I remember we were at Tilney Hall down near Basingstoke, and that was our base uh, just down the, a, uh, the M3. And uh, the week before the match, we were there for about, I don't know, a week, 10 days or whatever before the first game. And um, we had two team meetings where the major topic that was discussed was what do we do when the All Blacks do the hacker? And there was basically two schools of thought. There was the uh, uh, backs who basically didn't like confrontation and basically was like, let's ignore it. We'll go and have a cup of tea behind the posts and just let them do it. And then when they finish, we'll come back and play the game. The opposite view was all the forwards who basically wanted to just go in the middle of the pitch and have a big punch up about it and sort it out. So we had this interesting sort of debate as to should we be confrontational and uh, aggressive or should we be 
non-aggressive and ignore it and whatever. And of course, the, the, the sort of the discussions went on between the backs and the forwards around, well, if we're aggressive and we really take it to the New Zealanders, well, that will wind them up and psych them up and then they'll play really well. Okay. Well, if we ignore it and go behind a post and don't, don't sort of acknowledge it's happening, we'll offend them and annoy them and psych them up and then they'll play well. What choice have you got? Flip and out, you know, so whichever way you go. And then we ended up going, what will we do? And we had one fight, one ignore. Uh, at one point, we even considered, um, you know, bringing in ACAS to try and sort out to how to share this all out between the backs and the forwards. And eventually, somebody, I can't remember who it was, somebody came with the idea, well, if some of us want to be confrontational and face it, some of us want to have our backs to it, why don't we just get into a circle so that those that can face it can face it and those that don't can have the back to it? Actually, that's quite a good idea, actually. That's not bad. So we said, we would do that. And he said, however, we do want to have some form of, you know, uh, taking it to them. So what we said was, we'll get into a circle and when they finish doing the hacker, what we'll do is we'll break and we'll take one step towards them. That was our sort of thinking. Because the rules were you had to stay one side of the 10 yard line on, on your side of the pitch. Great. At this point, Will Carling picked up. He's, uh, he'd been captain three years, so um, he was still, uh, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't bored us yet with his speeches by that stage. So he, and he was a psychology student from Durham University, so he was coming up with this psychology stuff. So he said, look, um, I'm not going to do this. You can't do this. And normally when I'm doing this, I'm doing this in front of an audience at uh, a rugby club or hotel or whatever. But um, one of the things, when you, when you think about it, when they do the hacker, the next thing that happens after a hacker is the whistle. So the hacker finishes, we line up, and the game starts. So as Will said, they have an advantage. They, they are ready to go with the game, and they've just done a hacker. So what we'll do is let's put our tracksuit tops on. And when they finish doing the hacker, we just go to the touch line very slowly, take our tracksuit tops off very slowly, hand them over. We then get back onto the pitch and get into our position. And only then when we're ready, we will tell the referee that we're ready for kickoff. Actually, Will, that's quite a good idea, we thought. That's very sensible. So I said, let's do that. So if you ever watch the game, you'll always notice. So we went out. Did the national anthems, we also sang national anthems, and then the crowd started brewing up because then I knew what was happening next. The anthems are over now, it's going to be the hacker. So we're all dressed in there, we're in our tracksuit tops on. We go into the into our side of the pitch, we get into our huddle, into our circle. So the forwards are all looking at the, uh, the hacker, and the backs are obviously ignoring it. Uh, and the, the hacker starts. As soon as the hacker starts, kamate, kamate, kora, kora, they start going. The crowd builds up and the noise in Twickenham just gets to a crescendo to the point where within that first, um, I want to say stanza, but that's showing I don't even know what stanza is, but the first line and we couldn't hear the rest of the hacker because the crowd was so loud. We're in our little circle, arms interlocked. And I can remember being one of the ones, obviously, when I back to the hacker, I saw sort of looking and I couldn't see the hacker behind me. I remember looking at the forwards opposite me saying, okay, boys, when do we need to break up? Because we wanted to break up and take this one step. So I looked, looked, boys, when do we need to break up? And all I could see were these eight forwards all looking past me at the hacker, all going <laughs> like this. When do we need to break up? <laughs> you know, we thought, I think it's over now because you could tell by the crowd. And so eventually, let's break up. So he broke up, faced around. Well, we were about 20, 30 seconds too late. They'd already finished doing the hacker and they were in position waiting for us. Well, that wasn't very good. So they're right. Let's take our time. We walked to the side of the pitch very slowly. We took our tracksuit tops off, handed it over, very slowly got back into position. Only when we were ready did Will say to the referee, okay, ref, we're ready. So we kicked off. Brilliant. And we lost the game 19-12. So that obviously worked. But the really interesting thing about it, and I'll try to do the next thing quickly because I'm just coming up for half an hour here, but one of the challenges from that was interesting. We still sort of, what do we do with a hacker? And I went on tour, um, so that was uh, 91. We went on tour to New Zealand in 1993. So Lions tour, we were out there for eight weeks. The thing about the hacker is it happens everywhere. So when you go and land on tour, you land, and literally everywhere you go, you will be welcomed by a hacker. So you land at the airport, you go into the, the town, you start, so Auckland, 
the first thing you do is welcome with a big civic reception. And of course, they get a hack and welcomes the England team into the things. We go and visit schools. And the first thing to do is the first 15 will go and do a hacker and welcome us into the school. We go and move to the next town and civic reception and a hacker and a school visit. So after eight weeks of doing all the, the tour stuff that you do, basically you get to know the hacker off by heart because it's sung to you about 15, 20 times. We, we did the same thing. We, we, we lined up opposite and... Uh, we um, did the tracksuit thing, whatever. Still didn't quite work for us in uh, in '93 because we lost the series two one. Um, roll four to 1993, in, uh, December, early December. The All Blacks then toured England, and the All Blacks had went round. They beat Ireland, they beat Scotland, and they beat Wales. And they were playing us last game at Twickenham in December, and so they were going for the Grand Slam for a touring side. And so now is England playing against uh, New Zealand. You know, the Lions tried to do it in the summer, didn't do it as well. Now it's England's turn. And my brother was on the wing this time. Yarn Evans was with me on the, on the Lions game. And so we adopt the same practice. We lined up, but this time rather get in a circle, we just accepted, look, just line up against your opposite number, just line up in a line and just face them and let them do what they want to do. We did the tracksuit thing. So we had the national anthems, got through national anthems, crowd build up again. We lined up, I was lined up against um, uh, a young lad called Jeff Wilson, very talented sports person. He played rugby for, uh, for New Zealand many, many times, got a lot of tries, but he also played one day cricket for New Zealand as well. Uh, my brother was on the wing and it wasn't the the, uh, the famous Jonah Lomu, but it was not far off. It was uh, Vine Gatugamala was on the wing opposite him. He wasn't as tall as um, uh, Jonah. He was uh, like five foot six, but he was five foot six wide as well. Um, so Tony had him and I had Jeff Wilson opposite me. So we lined up and they all lined up. And I don't know what this, you sort of, they, they line up in a certain way and I'll explain that in a minute. So they started up and they started going to the, uh, the hack and they started singing uh, Kamati Kamati. And of course the crowd built up and everything. And by this stage, we're just opposite and we just sort of stood there and we hands behind the back. And I was just thinking, I was just staring at Jeff uh, doing his stuff. And I remember vividly just sitting there and he started singing the hacker and all I just was started mouthing. I don't know why I did it, just that. So I just mouthed the words while they're doing the hacker. They finished doing the jump and everything else and we split, started the game. At this time, for change, we actually won the game. We won the game 12-9. No, 15-9, that's right, 59. It wasn't an uh, expansive game of rugby as in tries galore, as it is like basketball nowadays, but it was a pure rugby, you know, purest rugby sort of real battle between two good sides. And it was all penalties and drop goals and we won the game. It was fantastic. As it was a touring side, we didn't have much of a uh, do afterwards and we finished. And you know, I will honestly say to you, that game was the, the most physically, mentally um, and physically tiring game I've ever played in. It was really, you know, a big game. Like I went to a bit of a post match on the Sunday. I'm driving. I'm driving home back to um, to Lincolnshire because I've got to go back flying again on on Monday. I remember driving back. Early days was 1993. So early days of mobile phones. So I had a brick attached to a breeze block type phone. I don't think you remember. And the phone went off in the car, which is running. And it was, it was um, Air Chief Marshal Sir Michael Steer, who was on. He was obviously an Air Force officer, and he was on the RFU committee, and uh, obviously. Um, a big sponsor of mine in the Air Force. Uh, Rory, fantastic result on Saturday. Great result for the Air Force and for England. So yeah, it was a really hard game. You know, says, oh, brilliant. You know, you played well. And I said, thank you, sir. It's great. You know, so how are you feeling? Oh, just you know, really, really, really pleased. But I'm just absolutely knackered. Really, nothing. It's a really tough game, mentally and physically. He said, oh yeah, yeah, it was. I can imagine that a really tough game against the All Blacks. And he said, so um, yeah. Um, so Rory, the reason for ringing up is um, the Combine Services are playing on Tuesday night against the All Blacks, and we'd like you to play. I come out there in the car going, oh, sir, sir just, oh, I'm, I'm knackered. I'm just struggling to think I can go back to flying on Monday. And I said, anyway, long story short, he's like God to me in the Royal Air Force. And I said, oh, okay, sir, I, you know, I will play, you know, fine. So can I, can I get down there, you know, Tuesday night, can I get there Tuesday afternoon, do I have to train? Can I just, you know, have a day off and recover the body before I go and play on Tuesday night? He said, yeah, yeah, no problem. Just get there for the game. The boys will appreciate you being there and the coaches understand. And, you know, just be great to be there. 
So bearing in mind, I live in Lincolnshire. I said to him, okay, so, so, so where's, where's the game? He said, Plymouth. Oh. Okay. So a six hour drive down to Plymouth. I turned up, I turned out for the combined services. I bless them. We had one or two uh, guys who'd played for England a few times or whatever, but um, in all fairness, we lost 11 nil to the All Blacks second team, which in the grand scheme of things, I think was a, an outstanding result, especially when they played with 14 men because the winger on the left wing was a flipping useless. He was a bit of a zombie wandering around the pitch because he was completely knackered. Um, but anyway, the, the postscript of the story was that we played that game, it's fantastic, but we went to um, HMS Drake, um, the wardroom at, uh, in Plymouth, and we had a big, huge dinner. And it's really weird because it's an evening kickoff. So we sat down for starters at like 10 o'clock. So I'm knackered, drove down six hours, I played a game, and then we eat, sit down for dinner at 10 o'clock. It's completely opposite from Julia, you and Paul and your eating this morning. And um, uh, I sat down. And I, was, I was sat down next to Jeff Wilson. And that's how I got to know him really well. He's a really nice guy, really nice guy. And we sat chatting and talking in various things. And of course, eventually we got talking about Saturday and we started getting chatting about the hacker. And I thought, now's my chance. I've got a Kiwi. I can ask him really. So I remember, so, so Jeff, come on, be honest with me. Do you do the hacker to psych yourself up before a game? He said, of course we do. I said, I, I knew it. I said, so do you do the hacker to try and psych up the opposition? He said, of course we do. I said, I double knew it. And he, he turned around, he said, look to me. He said, he said, however, I'm giving the hacker my all. And I'm looking at you and I'm trying to psych myself up and I'm trying to psych you up. And all I could see was you singing the words back to me as I was stood there doing the hacker. And he said, it completely blew my mind. Actually, that was fascinating because I wasn't thinking about it. And, she, and he eventually said, you know, they do, they do it to psych themselves up. And nowadays they get, they're very, they're very well organized now. Um, Buck Shelford back in the uh, late eighties, uh, he was uh, a Marion. Hey, Rory, can I just uh, just interrupt you? We, we're we're in danger of running out of time. And wonderful stories. Um, I literally have got one minute to go. Okay, okay, finish up. Thank you. I'll sir. finish it off and just say what was interesting was the response of him and what came out of it was the fact that when you think how it dis how the hacker affects you, it was two situations of us talking about what to do about the hacker was the bit that was off-putting, not the hacker itself. If you can't, it's basically a nice little song and dance. And if you're standing in front of them and it affects you, well, should you play, be playing international rugby? So the whole learning I got from that was the context of, it's actually the fear about what might happen is the thing that puts you off rather than the event itself. And it's a bit of a salutary lesson with that. Anyway, that's it. I hope you found it interesting and thought-provoking. Thank you. Hey.